All right. I, I think uh, hopefully people are still joining us here from afar. Thank you. And uh, a little housekeeping. Um, if you would, everyone, first off, welcome. Uh, but um, if you if you could keep your uh, microphone on mute, unless um, you're speaking, that would probably help everyone so we don't get feedback. Hopefully we're coming in fairly loud and clear here. And uh, I will now uh, turn the annual meeting of the Steamship Historical Society over to our president and chairman, Patrick Dacey. All right, good morning, everyone. As the uh, president of the board, I have the distinct honor of um, calling to order the 86th annual meeting of the members of the Steamship Historical Society of America. So welcome all to not only our board members, but all the members that are joining us uh, from afar. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say on behalf of the board that we, we send our best wishes for um, anyone who uh, suffered any damage or harm through the devastation of Hurricane um, Ian, and especially uh, if there are any members that were affected. So certainly you're in our thoughts. Um, there are going to be a few administrative changes. Today's agenda, if you're going to be following through, we're just going to uh, change the order of some items uh, just to, uh, to make it easier. Um, we, we do have um, our, our treasurer who has been a bit delayed. Um, so with that, the meeting is open. I will ask that if you are speaking for the first time so that all of our uh, members watching know who you are, please address yourself in the position that you hold. Uh, and you only really have to do it once, and from then on, everyone should be familiar with the, uh, the names. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our secretary, Andrew Coggins, for determination of a quorum for today's meeting. Okay, uh, Matt, I believe you have the uh, um, num the ballots, and do we have <laughs> enough for a quorum? Indeed, we do, and thank you. And I always defer to to our longtime board member Barry Ager, to who at one time didn't you even have the distinction of being uh, a title of. Uh, parliamentarian. Yes, yes, <laughs> parliamentarian. Until I made a decision somebody didn't like and then it went away. <laughs> um, yes, and, and we would also make note that the proxies, the three proxies that people chose on the ballots are all present or, or online. Very good. Thank you, Barry. And, and thank you, Andrew. How many do we have? Uh, by the bylaws, we need 25 ballots. I have here uh, 31 in in hand, and then there are several around that will be collected later um, in the okay. meeting. Okay, so we do have the quorum. Yes. Okay, so then I will turn it back over to you now. Okay. All right. Well, you're right. You. <laughs> You have, absolutely will because our point three on our agenda. And those of you at home, I neglected to mention, but on our website is the agenda and uh, a few of the reports. Some of the reports will be done um, just verbally uh, today and then will be posted after the meeting um, on the website. Um, um, so if you have the ability, I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff. You probably don't even need an agenda to follow, but if, uh, if you would like one, you can go to sshsa.org and scroll to the bottom and just write um, a PDF that's clickable and openable um, right online from our homepage. So the, the call for the ballots is um, agenda item three here. And that is for me. And so if anyone here in the room uh, has a ballot to turn in, then please do so now. And virtually, if you have them, um, we'll try to deal with them virtually, but I think that most likely your vote may not impact the outcome. Oh, what you need? I'm just getting this in the book. Oh, all right, Rochelle, thank you. No, no, don't be sorry. Okay, anyone else? Very good. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Chairman, I think we're all set there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so then moving on to agenda item four, which is approval of the minutes. Okay, um, we have received the 
uh, minutes for the 85th annual meeting of members, which was uh, conducted uh, Saturday, 23rd October, 2021. Um, they have been prepared by our secretary, Andrew Coggins. Um, is there any questions or concerns regarding the minutes as written? If I, not, just, oh. I just made um, one update that I neglected to put on the, the draft, and that is it should say actually minutes instead of agenda on the on the top left there. So for our files, um, the rest is straightforward and, and right on. Move to accept with the correction. Okay. Second. Okay. So that is moved by Barry Ager and seconded by Jimmy Zat Warnicki. And that was for the correction of the minutes. If there's no further discussion, is there a motion on the floor to accept the minutes? Okay. Second. second. In favor? Uh, okay, who made the motion to accept? Barry. Okay. And second. And then Eric. Jimmy Z. Okay. Did you have two or did you have the correction? We did the corrections first. And then, uh, so the okay. first was Barry and Jimmy Z, and the second was Barry and Eric T. Dave and Eric T. Yeah. He did it. He did it separately. Barry. Right. He, he accepted did. the change, and then we accepted the total minutes as oh. written. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're okay, Barry. Okay. Your name's going to appear in there. <laughs> oh, want to get everybody. We want everybody. It's one of the next thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. At, at this time, what I'd like to do is just do my my uh, president's report. And again, it's an opportunity for me to highlight some of the significant uh, achievements that the um, your organization has made, and I'm going to specifically focus on uh, since our last board meeting, which would have been in, in July. Uh, so once again, I'm very happy to report that the state of our organization continues to be strong and that since our last board meeting in July, we continue to move in a positive direction in all areas, especially with regards to our organizational educational endeavors. Since the last meeting in specific, I'd like to report that last week, the Champlin Foundation has referred our application to their distribution committee for their consideration in November. This is good news, but only verifies that we are still in a running for a grant. We hope to receive positive response during the November timeframe. And a lot that I will highlight will be discussed at uh, a greater length during the meeting. I'd also like to report, which is significant news for our organization and other maritime historical organizations throughout the country, that recently Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer introduced an amendment to the Mat National Maritime Heritage Grant for 2023-2024. And they've authorized in the act $10 million for the National Maritime Heritage Grant Program. This is a major step towards securing funding for maritime heritage. And the next step is to ensure that their funds are appropriated by the House and Senate. Um, we, uh, on, on the board, are going to be contacting our local members in the House and Senate on behalf of our organization. And we're going to encourage members to also contact your representatives to support this appropriation of funding. And this is very significant because this is some of the uh, limited funding that we are actually um, allowed as maritime historical organizations. And it comes as a result of um, a, a byline in the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, so now $10 million is one of the most significant increases that we have seen in many years. So we'll stay on that and hopefully um, get a piece of that for our organization. Um, next is that the Love Collection is now posted on our virtual museum. I wanna personally thank Ashton and her team for the excellent work in photographing, organizing, and documenting with historical notes, the collection as an online resource. If you have the opportunity, please go to our virtual site on our website and take a look at it. It's wonderful. And in addition, there are various physical pieces of the collection, which are now on display in the Ship History Center if you do come up and see. So certainly now the collection is being able to view physically and digitally on, online. Uh, next, in the last two weeks, under Matt's coordination, a four-page flyer, which updates our members on the status of our full ahead campaign was sent out. It captures the current status in the campaign while reminding our members of our continued financial needs. And I think as uh, Don has always pointed out, the president doesn't get his till the end. So I haven't seen it yet, but I, I I, I, I've seen a prototype and uh, it's, it's a good piece of work. <laughs> in addition, Power Ships number 322 went out to our members. It was once again an excellent publication with articles of great interest as well as new information. Credit must once again be given to the Editorial Planning Committee and Jim Pennypacker 
for their efforts. Um, through my frequent calls with Matt, our executive director, I continue to appreciate the dedication and professionalism of Matt and the staff for their day-to-day -day efforts with our organization. During my calls, and even sitting in on a weekly staff meeting, I appreciate not only how busy the staff is, but also how professional everyone is in getting the job done and assisting everyone else as a shared endeavor in our overall success. Now, when we finish the annual meeting, we will uh, go to a closed board session. And I just want to let the membership know some of the activities that we're planning during that session. Um, one of the key things that we're going to focus in on today is that with the successful Full Ahead campaign coming to an end next year, we can report that our financial performance for 2021 was excellent, and we're hoping for a strong final quarter for 2022 to offset our weaker performance in the first three quarters. We will continue to evaluate our current financial status to include our profit and loss statements, as well as our projected financial performance for 2023, and identify what additional fundraising methods we'll initiate when our full ahead campaign is completed. This could, but could include, but not limited to, continued emphasis on corporate and government grants, corporate sponsorship, and a continued focus on stewardship within our membership. Um, the board will also focus on examining our current membership status and analyzing trends and analysis to determine a path forward to increase our members' base for the future. Um, obviously, uh, Brian Lucier is our, our membership director and has been doing a wonderful job, uh, and the board is going to look and assist and analyze and see where we can increase uh, membership for our future. Um, so that's going to be significant and covered today. And finally, as our board of directors continues to evolve, evolve, it's with sadness and appreciation that we recognize two members of our board who are leading at the end of their current term. Both Tom Reagan and Doug Bryan have been dedicated board members who have greatly contributed to our overall success. And I want to thank each of them on behalf of the board and look forward to working with them in the future. So, Tom, personal thanks. And on behalf of the board, thank you for a job well done. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our executive director, Matt Schulten. Thank you, Pat. And, uh, and Tom and Doug, you know, just because you evolve off the board doesn't mean you're off the hook, you know. That. <laughs> so thank you. So um, my report um, is, a, I think, complements what, what Pat had to say, um, that we've had much progress on many fronts since our last annual meeting on October 23rd, 2021. A few of these highlights include um, completion of an extensive audit uh, by an outside CPA um, independent of our organization um, and indication over this multi-month period during the pandemic was that our processes and systems in place are consistent with accepted standards and, uh, and that um, we're in good shape. Now, since I've been here, there was never a full extensive audit. So this was the, the first one in my tenure. And I know in the past we've had reviews and things, but this was literally every receipt, every disbursement, everything. Um, uh, complete. So, and this is something as we receive more grants from foundations and from the government, um, we'll look to doing annually. Um, so look for that coming in our, our next fiscal and calendar year. Also, um, culmination of 18 months of diligence emerging uh, with a new strong yet adaptable and evolving strategic plan, um, which includes uh, pretty captivating vision um, um, an inclusive values statement and refined yet comprehensive mission. So it builds on what we've had previously, but it, it provides direction um, and a roadmap, a chart for the future. The silent phase of our full ahead campaign has kind of culminated. You may recall we sort of launched this to stakeholders and donors and on around uh, March 1st, 2020. And at that time, 
it was suspect as to what are we doing and how are we going to survive and somehow we we stuck with it and succeeded so that silent phase was just talking with people beyond the feasibility and and getting people excited listening a lot getting feedback developing then the the strategy for the financial plan and working with a committee of people that started several years before the actual launch of of that committee and i can tell you tom tom reagan was one that was there from the get-go um, and so we've successfully um wrapped and and have have just reached two million dollars from those efforts um toward our goals um, of of programs of infrastructure of building acquisition um and now the public phase to all of our general members and beyond is is out there now. Um, noteworthy too, um, on our books and and within our tax return, you'll see that uh, it's noteworthy that the auditor uh, recommended, as we knew he would, the removal of having our artwork collections on our books. Um, museum standards of the 1950s are different than today, and it became something that that we knew we needed to address, and so that was addressed. Um, I just want to thank everyone who's supported us over the last year, especially Pat and Denise Stacy taking over the helm, and I do say Denise because I know she's always here. She's in the background, and she keeps you kind of moving along pat and appreciate that and appreciate <laughs> you uh, <laughs> i've had several occasions where i've been able to uh, intersect in new jersey and meet with uh, pat and denise at various museums at their home and they've opened their home to staff as well so if anyone's in the glenn gardner area it's always a good topic and good meeting um, I also want to thank the Posner Foundation um, and other donors, um, Ted Skull, who's who's here as well, for supporting and providing real, um, uh, not just financial support, but um, criticism in a critical way and helping us move forward with ideas to to that align with our vision and with our mission. Um, it's really making a big difference. You'll hear a little bit more about that as we move forward. Um, also want to thank, obviously, our crew here. Um, Astrid, Drew, our curator of 14 plus years, uh, archivist, whatever, we can't really label you. You started off as an intern and now, you yeah, know, right. And now through a Posner grant, we have two assistants um, in Heather, who is here with us, and Tessa, um, Brian Lucier, who's at the command post around the corner here, making sure this technically is working for us. He, oh, he's great. He's been here almost, uh, gee, almost eight years, probably. And Amy Bachari, who is our education stalwart leader and social media guru, um, who joins us today in Ireland uh, from overseas. Um, all these folks and then um, um, two with some consultants that have helped us, Michelle Berard over the last two years and her advisors as we evolved our campaign and move forward. I also wanna thank our editor in chief, Jim Pennypacker of PowerShips Magazine, our designer, the world's best designer, John Goschke and uh, Richard Barwis and Mike Riley um, with Perfection Press and Advertising as well as Elise uh, Alyssa Hallisey, who's been with us for 15, almost 15 years as well. Um, thank you, members and, and chapter leaders who keep us going and keep us vibrant during these uncertain times. And finally, thanks to those volunteers who have tirelessly submitted articles to our re and act as regional columnists, one who we have here with us, Rich Turnwald in the audience here and probably others. I know many of you have submitted articles and features in the past. Donald, it's about time for you to do another article too, just saying. And, 
Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we are in a solid uh, position, um, but we, we need to, to uh, stick to what we're doing and have, have uh, even more um, focus uh, on this final quarter and moving into next year as we culminate so that we uh, reach that finish line um, in a strong manner. Um, we like calling it our safe harbor, um, even though the campaign will wrap up regardless of the, the, the final numbers. Um, the, the fundraising will continue. We'll still have programs, we'll still have needs, um, but we're clicking things off, checking boxes and things that you can't see there necessarily virtually, but those here today. And when you come visit, you will see um, as a result of the, the fundraising and the campaign, this building has had some improvements that we didn't really dream of a few years ago. One, uh, every light bulb, fluorescent light, half of which weren't functioning because of bad resistors and things, um, now are LED and they, it's, it's night and day difference and, and, uh, and uh, no UV uh, problems. And we have film on some of the windows to um, blocking out the sun's ray. So anyhow, I just want to thank you all, let you know that we are, oh, Andy, if you could um, mute your microphone, I think we're getting a little feedback. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, but we're in a solid position. We got a lot ahead. We have a new $100,000 challenge from the, the Posner uh, Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and hopefully we will achieve that by, by year's end and finish strongly, as Pat said. So thank you, and I look forward to uh, interacting with all of you as, as we steam full ahead. All right, thank you, Matt. And as uh, I indicated in the beginning, we're going to postpone our treasurer's report uh, to a little later. So we'll pick up now with the report of our uh, archivist, Astrid Drew. So um, I do have some photos and things to share. I'm not sure if Brian, um, how that's going to work, but um, we can just go through uh, what I have, just some, uh, some highlights of uh, the collections that we took in or donations that we took in in 2021 uh, and 2022. Um, uh, ah, there we go. So uh, William C. Davert uh, generously gave uh, ship plans and artifacts from the SS United States. Um, that's just uh, one of the um, portable windows that he, he gave. I believe actually that was from um, a doorway on, on board the ship. Um, but uh, yeah, terrific contribution, especially the, the plans we're excited to uh, look through those. Um, also a, a dining room chair from the Fall River Line Steamship Commonwealth um, that was transferred from the Mariners Museum. I went down and, and picked that up myself. Uh, that was a fun trip. <laughs> Um, and uh, family of Captain Warren G. Leback donated their father's collection, uh, which is really exciting. It's a, it's a, in terms of size, it's pretty modest, but it's very varied, and it has uh, items from the Grace Line and uh, Sea Land companies, um, and also his uniform, which is uh, super fun. Um, that also uh, that will be able to help us illustrate of this, you know, interesting moment in shipping history, moving from mm -hmm. kind of more traditional. Uh, you know, a, a cargo handling and moving into containerization. So cool stuff. Uh, Mr. Norman, Norman Laske uh, gave a array of general arrangement plans, photos, books, and artifacts, and uh, uh, mostly centered on T2 tankers. Um, picture you see now, now is actually a, a model from the Leback collection of, uh, of a container ship. So uh, a nice uh, break from our usual ocean liner fare of our uh, ship models, <laughs> um, which I very much enjoyed. Uh, and, uh, um, but uh, Mr. Laske was able to uh, come here in person and uh, give a little tour and also sit down and, and talk with us about his work as a uh, surveyor and, uh, and his experiences. Um, he also brought some really neat telegraphs um, both from the uh, their bridge and uh, engine room telegraphs. I believe that's the bridge telegraph. Um, and, uh, and I think I also have a photo of the uh, engine room one. Yeah, there she is. Uh, 
So uh, that, in addition to a lot of things, I'm excited about that because that will be able to uh, that will enable us to have some fun opportunities to illustrate communications on board ships and and how all that works and the differences between what goes on in the engine room versus the bridge, um, the experience of being on board a vessel and how it works, uh, which we get a lot of questions with uh, from uh, from researchers, whether it's uh, historical researchers or writers. Um, those people are, are especially interested in that. So interested, uh, very excited about opportunities to use these uh, donations in that way. Um, and of course, as was mentioned, uh, the Vincent Love Collection um, is with us on loan. Um, and uh, that loan period ends uh, this year, but um, there's ample opportunity to kind of renegotiate that to either extend the loan period or to transfer these to our permanent collections. Um, the, uh, yeah, as mentioned, uh, we were able to uh, launch the virtual museum. So I very much encourage you to check it out um, and uh, you know, let us know what you think. Um, what's pictured there is a very cool uh, card catalog um, attributed to the Titanic. Um, we think that it was probably created during the inquiry after she, like just after she sank. Uh, it's a card catalog of all passengers and crew on board the ship and uh, alphabetized um, irrespective of, you know, class or, or station and uh, indicating who was lost and who was saved and uh, what became of them. Um, very, very interesting document. Um, and uh, we're very excited to kind of dig into that. Uh, but um, Heather, Tessa, and I are, are really excited about opportunities for, for that one as well. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking of, of staff people, um, some of the changes um, between uh, 2021 and now are that we have two new staff people in collections, Heather uh, Kisilowicz and Tessa Mediano, who are our assistant archivists. They are a tremendous help, make me feel much more sane in uh, how I'm you know, how I'm managing my energy and, and focus. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've been doing are um, revamping the display areas. So this is a before image of a, uh, a display cabinet in our lobby. And uh, we kind of changed it around to kind of illustrate the beginning of, of the steam era. So we have more traditional um, steamboat models in there, some steam engine models, and uh, and also our uh, the classic uh, North River steamboat model um, up top. Um, so uh, we have pretty minimal interpretation there right now, but definitely that's going to expand um, in the coming weeks. And uh, another view of our display area too, this is a before, image of our atrium display and uh and then the after is our love exhibit display so we have some um and it's the love exhibit is kind of intermingled with other items from our collection so some of those models the ssus and america um are from uh doug tilden i believe and uh, uh so they serve to illustrate and, and complement um the items in the love collection that we're highlighting so um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, I highlighted some things from here, but uh, there were also numerous other smaller donations of ephemera and books. And I really appreciate um, whether you're in the audience today or, or not uh, participating today. Thank you very much, um, especially for your patience of helping, helping us out of providing um, lists of your, of your books or going through our catalog yourselves. Uh, and it, it really helps to streamline the work that we do here. I very, very much appreciate it. Uh, so um, with that, uh, I will leave it over to, we're gonna share a, um, a clip of a podcast that we did. Uh, we're really excited about expanding these sort of opportunities too, to uh, highlight both you know, our, our education programming, but also like collections work and what archivists do, because mentioned before, you know, <laughs> what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an archivist. Oh, what does that mean? So, uh, yeah, so we're hoping that things like a podcast and, and other uh, sort of endeavors will enable us to reach out to people on a much broader, you know, way and broader platforms and, and, uh, and tell people what we're doing, whether you're members or not. So, yeah. Right. Um, 
<laughs> so cross your fingers for technology here and let's yeah yeah see. let it roll we have to optimize zoom for uh audio and video uh -huh. yeah. Good here to there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. We're supposed to show the closed caption version here <laughs> yes. for those to read at home. Well, you know, we tried. It didn't quite work here, um, but it's available on our website. So those of you at home, um, it's a it's a fabulous uh, broadcast and one of several different things that we've done just in the past year from podcasts to webinars. YouTube videos, oral histories, uh, but uh, yeah, let's, let's right. And, and again, we did send a link out. Uh, yeah, let's one do of the that. Late tele telegraphs, we can send it out again. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our treasurer, Nick Langard, for the treasurer's report. Okay. You have the uh, <clears throat> treasurer's report in front of you. Uh, for the fiscal year 2021. <laughs> As of December 31st, 2021, we had posted an ordinary income of 1,036,600 1, against expenses of 646,368 for a net profit of 390,292. With other income, uh, 55,336 and other expenses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Other expense. Yep, go ahead. Other expenses of 42,515. Our total net income grew by 403,114. In general, the year. 2021 was, by most all accounts, unprecedented. For SSHA specifically, it was extraordinary. While the pandemic and general uncertainty surrounded all of us, SSHA struck to its core mission, focused on stewardship and fund development, and doubled down on its commitment to continue down the path toward sustainability. It was not easy, but with the assistance of many, 2021 became the most successful financial year in our organization's history. As this treasurer's report clearly indicates, we have made progress within our full ahead campaign and in realizing success with our management of activities and programs. Our budget was larger than ever before, yet we reached our revenue targets and we spent less than was projected. This success provided SHA with a net income of over $400,000 for fiscal 2021. Overall, pledges, grants, and contributions to Full Ahead for many, totaling almost $2 million over the last two years since launch, we were able to transition from the silent phase of our campaign to the public phase. Ultimately, we are in a good position to continue forward, and we intend to wrap up the fall ahead, the full ahead campaign in the spring of 2023. All that being said, thus far through three quarters of 2022, actual income trails significantly behind projections. Performance in all three quarters lag behind anticipated budgetary projections, yet there is still solid opportunity to reverse this trend in the fourth quarter. Many irons are in the fire, including a new $100,000 Posner challenge, cultivation and stewardship of scores of supporters, and the real potential for a significant grant from the Champlin Foundation. The ask is $250,000, to reduce our mortgage debt. 
While none of this is a certainty today, the potential exists for a strong finish. It will take all of us working together to make it our, to our safe harbor. I know, and our I know I and our board is up to this challenge, and I trust that you as members, stakeholders, and donors will also want to do your part to help SSHSA succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions regarding the treasurer's report? Okay, if not, move along to uh, Amy. Hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Amy Bachari. I'm the education director. Um, so I'm just going to give a few brief highlights of some work we've been doing in education. Um, we recently received a grant from the Ocean State Charities Trust. And so that grant is going to help us. Um, we've hired some education consultants who are basically going to review the lessons that we already have and ensure that they're um, compliant with Common Core standards. So Common Core is the most widely used standard. Um, there is no set nationwide standard for education, um, which makes it a bit complicated, but most states use Common Core. And so that's sort of what we're trying to do and to put those um, standards right at the front. So teachers, when they're looking for material can say, okay, this lesson hits this standard and they know right away that they wanna use it. Um, so that's, Great. And then we also are using funds from that to promote our education program via social media marketing. Um, so we can sort of target specific teachers. If it's a science lesson, we can target it um, specifically to science teachers and certain grade bands and things like that. Um, another really exciting thing that we're doing with that grant is we're going to do our very first family day. So we're partnering with Warwick Public Schools and their Title I program. So Title I is basically a federal program that gives financial assistance to schools that have high concentrations of low income families. And so it's a way to give money to these schools to ensure that they're, you know, um, that they're getting and meeting the challenging state academic standards. So um, we're hoping that that's gonna take place on November 12th, and that's gonna be the first, hopefully of many that we do with them. Um, we've been trying to partner with them for a long time and with the pandemic, you know, it was just, things kept falling through. So um, we're really excited about that. Um, another really fun highlight that we're doing, which is uh, my favorite thing to do is oral histories. Um, so, you know, our mission is to document, preserve and share. And so this is a great way to document history and to talk to people who have these really interesting stories to tell and that align with our mission and our themes of trade, immigration and leisure. Um, so, so far we've done, I think, 10 oral histories total um, and more to come. Um, so we're doing them over Zoom and we are able to have a transcription. So it's, they do closed captioning as well. And now it's not perfect. There's still some editing that needs to be done, but it does save time um, so that we don't have to go and, and listen and sort of hand type all of that out. So um, in the future, we're going to be working with the archives department and figuring out how to sort of uh, come up with a standard for storing the oral history. So that's coming down the line. Um, and so basically that oral history program feeds into our next big and really fun uh, program called SHIPS, which stands for SHIPS History, Influence and Power Series. And I've been working with Ted Skull. Um, he's generously donated funds for this and, and a lot of his time uh, working with me on this. And so we're basically taking those oral histories that we've conducted and pairing them with our primary sources. So whether it's photos from the archive, um, historic videos, menus, ephemera, um, and also things from people's personal collection because they may have images of themselves on these ships um, and creating films based on that. So that has been so much fun for me. Um, I can't talk enough about it, but um, so basically these films are all on our YouTube channel but they're also in our education program. So they serve as a complement to our lessons um, and, and lesson plans and things like that. So you, we've done three films so far on immigration. Two are completed on leisure with one that's in progress now, which will be done before the end of the year. And then um, the next topic is trade. So uh, we're very excited about those. And you'll 
Well, hopefully we'll see a clip when I'm done with my presentation, but if not, I'm gonna tell you a really easy way to find them all. Just go to shiphistory.org slash ships. And if you wanna watch the podcast that we did, or sorry, listen to the podcast that we did, just go to shiphistory.org and it's right on the homepage. So you can click and listen to it from there. Um, the next highlight I just wanna mention is, I know last year I sort of talked about how we were optimizing the website and making it uh, more searchable and uh, search engine friendly, I guess. Um, so we have a new blog, which comes out monthly. So the education blog is just a way to share with teachers different topics that they might wanna use um, related to steamships and different um, subject matter. And we'll you know, include images and things like that. And so that comes out monthly and that's a way to sort of keep our content flowing and that helps us with search engine optimization as well. So I'll briefly just talk about analytics really quickly. So um, from the difference basically from 2020 to 2021, we saw a 65% increase in users, which is awesome. 54% um, increase in page views. We had, um, now this is the search engine optimization bit, which is awesome, is that we had a 56% increase in people finding us just by Googling something that they're interested in and then coming to our lessons and finding what they're looking for. So that was um, that was sort of a big uh, undertaking that we did and we're really proud of that. And we've also had a 17% increase in events on the page. So events would mean, um, for example, if somebody opens a page and they're looking at it, did they download anything? Did they click links? And when you see that, you sort of know people are interacting with it and using it more. So that's a good way to sort of measure um, if the material is impactful for people. So that had a 17% increase. So uh, we're very excited about all that. And um, I just wanna thank Ted again for this great program that we're doing. And we're gonna try to show you a clip now. We're having issues. I think it's a problem with the audio coming through. Um, so if it doesn't work, then again, go to shiphistory.org slash ship so you can see it. But this is the latest um, film that we've done on student ships. It was an interview with Paul Klee about his experience traveling to Europe um, as an adult at 17 for the first time. Um, and it was a really fun interview. So hopefully, fingers crossed, technology works. Ted, did you want to say something? Oh. Ted, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I just want to um, just want to uh, kind of explain just briefly the way Amy and I work together um, for student ships. Um, that was the subject that uh, that I came up with, and I thought it'd be really fun for people to look back to into their youth and how there was the day when student ships were the cheapest way to get abroad to do an advanced uh, degree, um, as I did um, when I went across uh, in 1966 to, to do a master's degree in, in, in London. And what I've done, what I do with Amy is I source the people that I know that have had this kind of experience, uh, talk to them a little bit about what the interview is gonna be like, loosen them up a little bit about uh, getting their memories active again because you know if you're in your 70s and you were uh, on a student ship that's uh, you know probably 50 or, or so years ago um, and then I provide Amy with some of the kinds of questions that she might ask um, about what happens on student ships from personal experience and and from other people uh, telling me and then I turn it over to her and I just love the way she interviews people, uh, she's just she she gets them, she gets them relaxed, and then she gets them really to start thinking about the past and has a way of digging into the past in these people's brains, and it comes up with just some wonderful stuff that I think is very useful uh, for people to understand the subject of studentships. And then the leisure activities on board is a fun thing that I think that a lot of young people will in, enjoy the kind of games that you play on on ships on long voyages and some of the uh, some of the routines that happen for instance crossing the line ceremony uh, was a big deal at one time um, and I was involved in that on a Union castle ship because I was the only American on board so they picked me as the victim 
uh, and we still have <laughs> we still have to uh, to do that little interview. Um, but it 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 brings out really the way that people um, could pass their time, feel better, meet people, and how important it was for uh, for a long voyage to be able to 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 uh, to maintain some sanity with with so many. Uh, days at sea, but we have a really good time with it, and she's just a genius with talking to these people. So there we are. You're here. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ted. I remember what a thrill it was that I could just legally, at least on board the ship, order a beer. And in front of the bar was a little dance area, and among the other activities, of course, you there was dancing in the evening, and I remember, don't laugh, twisting. Doing the twist to Chubby Checker, uh, to a Chubby Checker record, because twisting was all the rage. The guys probably had Madras jackets. In those days, life was more formal, and I don't think you would travel without a jacket, and I probably had a mattress jacket too. But I do remember doing the twist. That was uh, kind of That's cool. that was a lot of fun. So we had a we we had a great time. I remember what a thrill it was that I could just legally. <laughs> Very good, Amy. Here, here. Take it away, Amy. I think Ted had something to say. I'll let Ted say. I'm mute. You're muted. <laughs> sorry. You're muted. I'll see if I can unmute you. There we go. Okay. Right. No, I just mentioned Paul. Uh, Paul and I met on the Flandre in 1958. Um, and we spent the, the voyage together playing deck tennis and so on and, and with my brother. And then um, uh, about what, so 20 years later or so, Paul resurfaces because he's heard about the World Ship Society. And so for the last you know 40 years, we've been really good friends. And I knew he'd be a wonderful uh, candidate or victim for uh, <laughs> part because he had so, such amazing experiences aboard the ships from a very, very young age and is still doing it now with his wife. So uh, it's it's a great interview. It's just wonderful. Thanks, Ted. That's all I had for education. So I'll turn it back to Pat. Okay, thank you, Ted. And thank you, Amy, for all the wonderful uh, work that you're doing. Um, we're going to move now if Brian is ready from the command post to do a report on membership. All right, howdy everybody. I am going to do my best. I actually have a uh, wonderful uh, Stephen Card litho behind me that uh, catches all of our lights, our uh, brand new LEDs. So I am going to do my best to block it with my head, which is only 50% as shiny as the uh, picture <laughs> frame. So um, yeah, so we, we, we kind of touched on some of the, uh, the stuff earlier for Treasurer's Report. When you're looking at 2021, uh, I, overall, I was very pleased. Um, we pretty much held our own. And, and that's kind of the, the theme of membership, unfortunately, over the last few years, or I should say fortunately, is that we are maintaining where we're at. We have trouble making significant growth, but we're also not seeing a significant drop off as many other small organizations have, particularly over the last couple of years with everything going on with the pandemic and uh, you know the stock markets all over the place. I mean, I don't need to, to list everything that's, uh, that's been going on. So, so overall, when you look just uh, at the 2021, we were 95% of our budget. So we came in just under 120,000, which was what we budgeted. And that is actually, I was kind of very impressed with that because uh, many of you may remember because many of you were generous enough to, to do this. Back in 2020, when the pandemic first started out, we had offered up a membership uh, drive where basically we had just asked everybody to renew for multiple years. It was kind of a great way, you know, you were getting uh, the value that you had always gotten as far as a subscription to the power ships and a membership with SSHSA, but we were kind of generating additional funds when we needed the most, you know, at that point, you know, again, I don't need to, to tell everybody that we had no idea what was coming up. It was a wild success, lots of people subscribing for three, four, five years in a row, but the, you know, the only downside of that was that we essentially had $18,000 worth of our 2021 memberships 
uh, that were given in 2020 as part of this promotion. So then, you know, when I look back at 2021 and seeing we came in $6,000 under what we were uh, expecting, you know, having gained 18,000 the year before, I'm really kind of happy as where we're at. The real uh, big thing that I've kind of been looking at over the last couple of years as we've been maintaining our membership is how can I kind of tighten the budgets? One thing that I had noticed, and, and we had had a lot of complimentary memberships uh, on the books, many of these going back long before I had gotten here. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we had just kind of tried to engage cruise lines, we had, you know, uh, members of the Council of American Maritime Museums, uh, local libraries, you know, it, hoping that we could either generate a discussion or, you know, that they would eventually become uh, members or donate or, you know, people that were going to donate. A lot of that really never happened, and I, a lot of it was because we didn't have the uh, the personal connection. Now, what we uh, so so I kind of looked at it. We had more than 800 complimentary uh, copies going out. So I've cut a lot of that back. We have a very targeted uh, number of comps right now, and it, and I think we want to go back out there. It's not that we want to say you know complimentary memberships are bad. I, not at all. Uh, I'm not opposed to that, but we need to have that kind of connection. So we can't just, you know, kind of blindly send them out to, you know, different companies. We need to know who we're sending it to. We need to have a conversation and we need to, you know, regularly go back to them and say, hey, would you become a paying member? You know, would you consider sponsoring an event? Would you consider, you know, advertising in the magazine? So now that, you know, we have uh, Amy Rajak uh, on board uh, doing a lot of the admin stuff, she can help me uh, kind of back up, make phone calls and, and take a few things off my plate. That's something that we really want to, you know, be looking at going forward. Um, the other thing that, you know, I just kind of wanted to touch on is that when you think about the outreach, it's not just the magazine. So we have a lot of uh, different things going on. Astrid and, and Amy obviously already touched on the podcast. They, uh, they touched on the SHIPS program, the education program. We're constantly trying to go out. We also have our two uh, newsletters. So we have the Ahoy and the Telegraph. That mailing list is more than 6,500. A lot of, you know, I, I shouldn't say, uh, you know, there are probably a little bit of bloat on there. I know we're not touching 6,500 people, but when you look down at the actual statistics, we have a 25% open rate. And, you know, for a national average is between 15 and 25. When you look at the click through, the number of people that actually click on something and move on to either our web page or to something else that we've linked to, it's 4.4%. National average is 2.5. So we do have, uh, you know, a little bit more of a uh, an engaging group. We we have people that are interested. You know, it's just kind of making that next step over and and turning them into donors and members. Um, you know, same thing over on Facebook and and Amy, both Amys. Uh, have been doing a, a great job on Facebook. We post new content. Um, I shouldn't say just Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're, we're putting new content just about daily up there. Uh, again, trying to bring in people from the outside. A lot of what it takes to bring on a member, I always say the cost of acquisition is high in both time and cost. It's really familiarity. And, you know, the two of them, Amy, you know, through the social media channels, they're great ambassadors. We've had, you know, a, a decent amount of people. It's it's tough to pinpoint exactly when they're coming in off of social media, but I've been noticing an uptick of people where we've had no prior contact before, you know, that they weren't anyone that we send complimentary magazines to or, you know, for whatever, had any kind of relationship, just coming on board out of the blue and joining at higher uh, levels. You know, I've noticed quite a few people starting at either cabin class or mariner. So, we're definitely getting out there and, and kind of getting the word out. Um, and then also, I just wanted to, you know, thank Pat Daisy, who's been uh, good enough to uh, share some of the World Ship events. So we've been able to offer those as, you know, bonuses to our members and to all the people that are on our uh, our mail list. So um, I think, I, I believe, and I can, Pat can probably speak a little bit better to this. I think we've been, you know, able to generate a little bit of traffic over there. And I've gotten a lot of great comments. Um, people who uh, saw them, you know, either saw past ones and, and asking when the next one's coming up, when the replays are coming up. So uh, it's definitely making an impact and, and something that uh, all of our people appreciate. So um, I think what I'm going to do is, you know, hopefully this works again. I'm going to close out. Uh, one nice thing that we uh, 
had a chance to participate in and you know kind of this goes toward the outreach and getting us out there to as many people as possible um uh, matt actually had a chance to moderate a panel on american innovation the steamboat and the age of industry um, brought in uh, three great uh, scholars talking about, you know, not only the beginnings of the, the steam era, but what it meant for the country, really just in the wheelhouse of everything that we want to be here. So it was really nice for SSHSA to have a presence on that. And I'm just going to play a uh, short clip for you on that. Let's all cross our fingers. And also um, the Union, as you can see, built a fleet of armored boats for the Western Theater. On the left, you have, of course, the famous Cairo, um, um, uh, it, which sank, uh, it was sunk by a torpedo, which we would call a mine. You can um, see the remnants of it at the uh, Vicksburg Military Park. Um, and then you have a lighter a craft called the Tin, they were tin clads, that's the USS Rattler. Um, but the, the the Union built 101 fighting boats as part of this fleet on the, on the Western rivers. It's the, the Western gunboat flotilla or the Mississippi squadron, and they had 26 service craft. This fleet, by the end of the Civil War, is as large as the largest blue water fleet, which is the North Atlantic blockading squadron. And at least 16,000 men served on this fleet during the course of the American Civil War. So it is a large operation. And they are the, the fleet is crucial to these early victories in the West. Um, and Grant probably, it's very difficult for Grant to take Vicksburg without the help of the Union Navy. But that's a whole nother story. I'm out of time. I'm a little breathless, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions at, at the end. That's awesome. Thank you so much with that. I mean, one of the things we have here at the Steamship Historical Society is three themes, immigration, trade, and leisure. And you tied in all those and add in the military aspect and war. And that takes us right to where we are today, too. And so it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce Dr. Paul Johnston to take it from here. Well, I want to thank my predecessors, Kevin and Robert, for giving the background that allows me the leisure to actually show some of the highlights from our steamboat heritage at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, can you see that first picture up on the screen there? Okay, great. What we're looking at is actually John Fitch's November 1791 patent for his duck, duck kicker, duck legged steamboat. Now, this is the French patent. We don't have the American patent. The American patent office, the, the uh, patent and trademark office burned and burned up a lot of the early patents. And they actually had to come back to the Smithsonian, which had some of the original patents still uh, on file to get the old records. But this is the French patent. And you'll notice at the top of the picture that there's a water stain there. And uh, I kind of don't want to do the research on that because this is the French patent. And the French patent had a fire in the late 19th century. And I'm wondering if maybe this was not water damaged and either discarded or thrown out. I don't want to know because it might be one of those things that we'd have to return. <laughs> I did. Uh, I, uh, I know it was a little longer than the other clips, but I did like the. Uh... A nice little admission there by Paul Johnston. So, um, so with that, uh, you know, like I said, uh, if you want to see the full uh, clip on that, that's the uh, National Association of Scholars, and again, it's American Innovation, uh, the Steamboat, and the Age of Industry. Um, and with that, I will uh, pass it back to Pat. And uh, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Brian, for uh, the report and everything that you're doing. I also want to point out that Brian did mention that uh, the World Ship Society Port of New York branch does share our monthly uh, meetings via Zoom. I did want to point out that we have on the uh, in the meeting today attending um, Doug Newman, who's a board member for the Port of New York Branch World Ship Society, who's actually the person behind who coordinates all of those uh, Zoom portions of the meetings. Uh, so any SSHA members that uh, do watch them, 
Uh, Doug, uh, thank you for uh, for everything that you do for both organizations. All right. Um, moving over to fundraising, yep. we'll turn it over to Matt once again. Thank you, Pat. Just briefly here, folks. Um, we're in the stewardship of people department now, as well as cultivation and, and raising funds. So as, as we reach that finish line toward that goal of uh, just over $3 million, our focus now for the Full Ahead campaign and what we're doing beyond that is really uh, diversifying on, on three fronts. One is our fellowship league. And this is the importance of our cherished relationships with members and friends who, who remember us in their estate planning. It's a difficult subject, but it's one that time and time again has, has helped this organization and has helped many other organizations. And that's something that you'll see more information on as we move forward, just bolstering those. To, uh, uh, National Association of Scholars. Whoops. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Um, we got somebody signing up right now. <laughs> um, also, uh, um, matching corporate gifts. They're so important because many employers or even former employers of, of firms where people have retired from make con uh, match gifts from individuals. So we're going to try to to mine some of those in a in a higher fashion too, because that's free kind of found money. Um, and, and two, this, this next several months, looking at multi-year pledges, because with the challenge that's on the table for year end, and the fact that we are in the fourth quarter, and many people have already um, made their contributions for the year, we can, we can leverage a pledge that is realized in 2023, but we can utilize that pledge for our 2022 match and have a, a much better um, doubler, really, in some case, triple um, the, the uh, return. So those are the big things uh, you all should have, as Pat mentioned, received the, this mailer. There'll be a follow-up with it. And I just hope to hear from as many people as, as possible um, on that. And, and the, the, the dollar um, commitments is huge, but I can't stress how we have all learned this, this stewardship of people, of ourselves, having a good time again, kinship, um, getting on committees, volunteering. And also, you know, if, if anyone out there is interested in, in joining the board, we have on our website now um, a nomination form. You can self-nominate or just fill it out. It'll be there year round at any time to, uh, to assist. If you know of anyone, feel free to nominate them. Um, and utilize that. So the only other thing that I have here, Pat, if there aren't any questions at this juncture is um, Jim Pennypacker did submit um, an editor's report. We'll make sure that's posted on the website or delivered to people that joined us on the meeting as well. Um, but I'll just summarize by saying we have about 40 plus articles in the pipeline. So we're in good shape there, um, but always looking for more. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jim, for the uh, report. Um, now we'll go to the election of uh, directors. Uh, our secretary had to provide official notice of the annual corporation meeting to all our members to include a ballot for those members running for uh, elected office on our board. Um, the ballots were received. They were tallied by non-interested parties. And I will turn it over to uh, our executive director now uh, for the report. Yep. And before I do that, I just want to, uh, to personally thank our um, nominating committee and its chairman, Tom Reagan, Darshil Silva, and Nick Langhart for all of your efforts in our elections. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I have the ballots and, and all three people running have received sufficient votes to elect them. Um, Dave Pickering has 31, Eric Takajan 34, Terry Tilton 33, and therefore I think we just have a, entertain a, a motion to accept the election as submitted, and then we are in good shape. Is that correct? 
Okay, is there a motion on the floor to accept the ballots as uh, read? Second. Darshell makes a motion. Move, move to accept the uh, the ballots and, and declare the directors on the ballot elected. elected. Okay. Darshell, would you second that? Okay. All right. So moved by Ager, seconded by Silva. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next thing is, we're, as we're winding down, is actually something that's that's fun <laughs> for a meeting, and it, it's one of those opportunities that you know, instead of talking about uh, uh, some of the other uh, events, it's, uh, it's awards. And as you know, our association annually provides awards to those individuals or or ships as designated and or nominated uh, by our members uh, who have distinguished themselves uh, throughout their career or in their efforts of supporting Steamship Historical and our mission. Um, recently, you may have seen on the Telegraph, Matt and I traveled down to uh, Staten Island where we were able to present the uh, pilot boat New York and New Jersey for our 2021 Ship of the Year, which um, uh, was very well received and it was a fun opportunity uh, for us to interact with the members of the Sandy Hook Pots Association. Um, we also are preparing a presentation for our Tug of the Year, which is uh, Sea Scout 281's uh, Sea Dart, which will, will happen shortly. Um, and uh, before we get to the words, just want to say that there was a determination that was made this year to encourage more membership participation in the awards process that we have uh, created an online nomination form. So certainly it used to come as part of uh, power ships. You would have to fill it out and send it in. Now it is electronic. You can do it all year long. We've extended the deadline for our 2022 nominations until December 1st, where we will then tally and make a, um, a decision as to the 2022 awardees. So it is again my honor to uh, make two awards. Uh, the first one I'm going to make is for 2021 and uh, it goes to Andrew Liza. And unfortunately he cannot be here today. And because of COVID, um, we were running into a little bit of a delay in getting some of these awards out, uh, but certainly he's deserve it. And I do want to uh, read it and we can enter it into the official record. And again, it's the Steamship Historical Society of America honors Andrew M. Lysak with its 2020 H. Graham Wood Award for Distinguished Service to the Society. Andy has been a member of Steamship Historical for more than 50 years, much of that as an active member of the Southern New England chapter. He served as corresponding secretary, program chairman, and chapter chairman, in addition to giving many presentations related to the Fall River Line. He has also volunteered at the Ship History Center, for the last several years, sorting and filing a massive quantity of maritime brochures and sailing schedules. We commend Andy for his many decades of service and his contributions to the overall goals, objectives, and missions of the Steamship Historical Society of America. So certainly this uh, is a honor well-deserved, and we will send it to him and make sure that he uh, receives it uh, soon. So uh, thank you, Andy. And the next award, we actually have the honor of having the awardee uh, attend. So, Rich, if you could come up here. And this is going to be Rich Turnwald, who flew up from Miami. So, this is once again the Steamship Historical Society of America, who's honoring Rich Turnwald with its 2021 J. Allen Award for Distinguished Editorial Content. Passenger ships have always been his major focus of rich interest, leading to his involvement in the Steamship Historical Society of America. He formerly served as chairman of the Florida chapter of Steamship Historical and is currently the Southern and Gulf Ports Regional Editor for Power Ships Journal. This award recognizes his decades of dedication, expert contact development, and volunteer spirit in all he does, and to share his passion with others. Born in Michigan, Rich has lived for most of his life in Miami, Florida, and over the past 40 years, he has worked several jobs throughout the cruise industry, both shoreside and cruise line operations management, and on board cruise ships in various positions, including Chief Bursar. He now owns and operates his own cruise agency, is an avid contributor to many online ocean liner enthusiast groups, and an author of ocean travel themed books. And Rich is probably one of the toughest beats uh, for our magazine, and that is, again, capturing the uh, cruise industry down in Florida, so it's a tough beat, but uh, well deserved and much appreciated. Thank and, you. Uh, and thank you. 
appreciate this. Um, <clears throat> I've contributed to when Frank Manuel was the regional editor for 40 years, I've contributed items. And then when he retired some 13 years ago, and I took over the regional editorial part of it, it's always been real rewarding. And I appreciate all the work that you folks do. And it's really an honor to be here. And thank you very much for this award. And we thank you. All right, the um, last order of business that we have prior to adjournment is a formal approval of the law acts of the Board of Directors since the 2021 annual meeting of members, which was uh, October 23rd, 2021 in Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, can I have a motion on the floor to approve the lawful acts of the board I saw during the last year? Hager, support by Pickering. <clears throat> All in favor? Any, any discussion? Any, any discussion? Yes. <laughs> All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. All right. All right. We, we would add that the minutes of the meetings of the meetings and the actions of the board are always available by request to the to the headquarters. Thank you. Before we adjourn, is there any uh, questions or, or concern from anyone present or in our uh, virtual audience? I think as, as uh, was adequately demonstrated today that uh, Steamship's Historical is involved in a wide variety of activities uh, to certainly uh, sell our brand, get our message across, and uh, you know in increase awareness uh, of ourselves, obviously through podcasts, videos, um, virtual talks, and the such, and everything that we're doing here. Uh, so certainly a lot is happening with your organization. And um, you know, I think we're we're all proud here of, of the efforts that everyone is making, and thank you for your support. Um, is there a motion on the floor for an adjournment? Jimmy Z, second. I second. Eric T, seconds. So so okay. moved, I guess. So moved, and the 86th annual meeting of membership for the Steamship Historic Society is closed.